Section 18 of the Ingoldsby Legends, First Series. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ingoldsby Legends, First Series, by Richard Harris Barham. Section 18. Jingolfus, or as he is usually styled in this country, Jingo, was perhaps more in the mouths of the general than any other saint on occasions of adjuration. See note. Mr. Simpkinson from Bath had kindly transmitted me a portion of a primitive ballad, which has escaped the researches of Ritson and Ellis, but is yet replete with beauties of no common order. I am happy to say that, since these legends first appeared, I have recovered the whole of it. Vide Infra. A Franklin's dog leaped over a stile, and his name was Little Bingo. B with a Y, Y with an N, N with a G, G with an O. They called him Little Bingo. This Franklin, sirs, he brewed good ale, and he called it Rare Good Stingo. S-T-Y-N-G-O. He called it Rare Good Stingo. Now is this not a pretty song? I think it is, by Jingo. J with a Y, N-G-O. I swear it is, by Jingo. A Lay of St. Jingolfus non multo post jingolfus in domo sua dormiens acisus est a quodum clerico qui cum uxero sua adulterare solabat coios corpum dum in ferato in sepulturum portaratur multi infermi de tactu senati sunt cum hoc ilius uxori referatur ab ansilla sua scilicet dominum suum quam martyrum sanctum miracula facari iridens illa et subsurans et ita gen gulfus miracula facitat ut puvinarium meum cantat etc etc wolfii memorabilia chingulfus comes from the holy land with his scrip and his bottle and sandal shoon full many a day hath he been away yet his lady deems him returned full soon full many a day hath he been away yet scarce had he crossed iunt the sea ere a spruce young spark of a learned clerk had called on his lady and stopped to tea this spruce young guest so trimly dressed stayed with that lady her revels to crown they laughed and they ate and they drank of the best and they turned the old castle quite upside down they would walk in the park that spruce young clerk with that frolicsome lady so frank and free trying balls and plays and all manner of ways to get rid of what french people called ennui now the festive board with viands is stored savoury dishes be there i ween rich puddings and big a barbecued pig and oxtail soup in a china tureen there's a flagon of ale as large as a pail when cockle on hat and staff in hand while on naught they are thinking save eating and drinking jingolfus walks in from the holy land you must be pretty deep to catch weasels asleep says the proverb that is take the fair unawares a maid of the banisters chancing to peep whispers ma'am here's jingolfus a coming upstairs pie pudding and soup the electrified group with the flagon pop under the sofa in haste and contrive to deposit the clerk in the closet as the dish least of all to jingolfus taste then oh what rapture what joy was expressed when poor dear jingolfus at last appeared she kissed and she pressed the dear man to her breast in spite of his great long frizzly beard such hugging and squeezing twas almost unpleasing a smile on her lip and a tear in her eye she was so very glad that she seemed half mad and did not know whether to laugh or to cry then she called up the maid and the tablecloths laid and she sends for a pint of the best brown stout on the fire too she pops some nice mutton chops and she mixes a stiff glass of cold without then again she began at the poor dear man she pressed him to drink and she pressed him to eat 
and she brought a foot-pan with hot water and bran to comfort his poor dear travel-worn feet nor night nor day since he'd been away had she had any rest she vowed and declared she never could eat one morsel of meat for thinking how poor dear gengulphus fared she really did think she had not slept a wink since he left her although he'd been absent so long he here shook his head right little he said but he thought she was coming it rather too strong now his palate she tickles with the chops and the pickles till so great the effect of that stiff gin grog his weakened body subdued by the toddy falls out of the chair and he lies like a log then out comes the clerk from his secret lair he lifts up the legs and she lifts up the head and between them this most reprehensible pair undress poor gengulphus and put him to bed then the bolster they place athwart his face and his nightcap into his mouth they cram and she pinches his nose underneath the clothes till the poor dear soul goes off like a lamb and now they tried the deed to hide for a little bird whispered perchance you may swing here's a corpse in the case with a sad swelled face and a medical crowner's a queer sort of thing so the clerk and the wife they each took a knife and the nippers that nipped the sugar-loaf for tea with the edges and points they severed the joints at the clavicle elbow hip ankle and knee thus limb from limb they dismembered him so entirely that e'en when they came to his wrists with those great sugar nippers they nipped off his flippers as the clerk very flippantly termed his fists when they'd cut off his head entertaining a dread lest folks should remember gengulphus face they determined to throw it where no one could know it down the well and the limbs in some different place but first the long beard from the chin they sheared and managed to stuff that sanctified hair with a good deal of pushing all into the cushion that filled up the seat of a large armchair they contrived to pack up the trunk in a sack which they hid in an osier bed outside the town the clerk bearing arms legs and all on his back as that vile mr greenacre served mrs brown but to see now how strangely things sometimes turn out and that in a manner the least expected who could surmise a man ever could rise who'd been thus carbonadoed cut up and dissected no doubt twould surprise the pupils at guys i am no unbeliever no man could say that o me but st thomas himself would scarce trust his own eyes if he saw such a thing in his school of anatomy you may deal as you please with hindus and chinese or a Mussulman making his heathen salam or a jew or a turk but it's other guesswork when a man has to do with a pilgrim or palmer by chance the prince bishop a royal divine sends his cards round the neighbourhood next day and urges his which to receive a snug party to dine of the resident clergy the gentry and burgesses at a quarter past five they are all alive at the palace for coaches are fast rolling in and to every guest his card had expressed half past as the hour for a greasy chin some thirty are seated and handsomely treated with the choicest rhine wines in his highness's stock when a count of the empire who felt himself heated requested some water to mix with his hock the butler who saw it sent a maid out to draw it but scarce had she given the windlass a twirl ere gengulphus head from the well's bottom said in mild accents do help us out that's a good girl only fancy her dread when she saw a great head in her bucket with fright she was ready to drop conceive if you can how she roared and she ran with the head rolling after her bawling out stop she ran and she roared till she came to the board where the prince bishop sat with his party around when gengulphus pole which continued to roll at her feet on the table bounced up 
with a bound never touching the cates or the dishes or plates the decanters or glasses the sweetmeats or fruits the head smiles and begs them to bring him his legs as a well-spoken gentleman asks for his boots kicking open the casement to each one's amazement straight a right leg steps in all impediment scorns and near the head stopping a left follows hopping behind for the left leg was troubled with corns next before the beholders two great brawny shoulders and arms on their bent elbows dance through the throng while two hands assist though nipped off at the wrist the said shoulders in bearing a body along they march up to the head not one syllable said for the thirty guests all stare in wonder and doubt as the limbs in their sight arrange and unite till gengulphus though dead looks as sound as a trout i will venture to say from that hour to this day ne'er did such an assembly behold such a scene or a table divide fifteen guests to a side with a dead body placed in the centre between yes they stared well they might at so novel a sight no one uttered a whisper a sneeze or a hem but sat all bolt upright and pale with affright and they gazed at the dead man the dead man at them the prince bishop's jester on punning intent as he viewed the whole thirty in jocular terms said they put him in mind of a council of trent engaged in reviewing the diet of worms but what should they do oh nobody knew what was best to be done either stranger or resident the chancellor's self read his puffendorf through in vain for his books could not furnish a precedent the prince bishop muttered a curse and a prayer which his double capacity hit to a nicety his princely or lay half induced him to swear his episcopal moiety said benedicity the coroner sat on the body that night and the jury agreed not a doubt could they harbour that the chin of the corpse the sole thing brought to light had been recently shaved by a very bad barber they sent out von townsend von burney von roe von men and von roance through chalet and chateau towns villages hamlets they told them to go and they stuck up placards on the walls of the stad ho murder whereas a dead gentleman surname unknown has been recently found at his highness's banquet rather shabbily dressed in an amos or gown in appearance resembling a second-hand blanket and whereas there's reason indeed to suspect that some ill-disposed person or persons with malice aforethought have killed and begun to dissect the said gentleman not very far from the palace this is to give notice whoever shall seize and such person or persons to justice surrender shall receive such reward as his highness shall please on conviction of him the aforesaid offender and in order the matter more clearly to trace to the bottom his highness the prince bishop further of his clemency offers free pardon and grace to all such as have not been concerned in the murther done this day at our palace july twenty five by command signed johann von rissel n b deceased rather in years had a squint when alive and smells slightly of gin linen marked with a g the newspapers too made no little ado though a different version each managed to dish up some said the prince bishop had run a man through others said an assassin had killed the prince bishop the ghent herald fell foul of the brussels gazette the brussels gazette with much sneering ironical scorned to remain in the ghent herald's debt and the amsterdam times quizzed the nuremberg chronicle in one thing indeed all the journals agreed spite of politics bias or party collision viz to give when they'd further accounts of the deed full particulars soon in a later edition but now while on all sides they rode and they ran trying all sorts of means to discover the caitiffs losing patience the holy gengulphus began to think it high time to astonish the natives 
first a rittmeister's frau who was weak in both eyes and supposed the most short-sighted woman in holland found great relief to her joy and surprise from one glimpse of his squint than from glasses by doland but the slightest approach to the tip of his nose megram's headache and vapours were put to the rout and one single touch of his precious great toes was a certain specific for chilblains and gout rheumatic sciatica tic douloureux apply to his shin-bones not one of them lingers all bilious complaints in an instant withdrew if the patient was tickled with one of his fingers much virtue was found to reside in his thumbs when applied to the chest they cured scantness of breathing sea-sickness and colic or rubbed on the gums were a blessing to mothers for infants in teething whoever saluted the nape of his neck where the mark remained visible still of the knife notwithstanding east wind's perspiration might check was safe from sore throat for the rest of his life thus while each acute and each chronic complaint giving way proved an influence clearly divine they perceived the dead gentleman must be a saint so they locked him up body and bones in a shrine through country and town his new saintship's renown as a first-rate physician kept daily increasing till as alderman curtis told alderman brown it seemed as if wonders had never done ceasing the three kings of cologne began it was known a sad falling off in their offerings to find his feats were so many still the greatest of any in every sense of the word was behind for the german police were beginning to cease from exertions which each day more fruitless appeared when gengulphus himself his fame still to increase unravelled the whole by the help of his beard if you look back you'll see the aforesaid barb gris when divorced from the chin of its murdered proprietor had been stuffed in the seat of a kind of settee or double-armed chair to keep the thing quieter it may seem rather strange that it did not arrange itself in its place when the limbs joined together perhaps it could not get out for the cushion was stout and constructed of good strong maroon-coloured leather or what is more likely gengulphus might choose for saints e'en when dead still retain their volition it should rest there to aid some particular views produced by his very peculiar position be that as it may on the very first day that the widow gengulphus sat down on that settee what occurred almost frightened her senses away besides scaring her handmaidens gertrude and betty they were telling their mistress the wonderful deeds of the new saint to whom all the town said their orisons and especially how as regards invalids his miraculous cures far outrivalled von morrison's the cripples said they fling their crutches away and people born blind now can easily see us but she we presume a disciple of hume shook her head and said angrily credat judeus those rascally liars the monks and the friars to bring grist to their mill these devices have hit on he works miracles pooh i'd believe it of you just as soon you great geese or the chair that i sit on the chair at that word it seems really absurd but the truth must be told what contortions and grins distorted her face she sprang up from her place just as though she'd been sitting on needles and pins for as if the saint's beard the rash challenge had heard which she uttered of what was beneath her forgetful each particular hair stood on end in the chair like a porcupine's quills when the animal's fretful that stout maroon leather they pierced all together like tenter hooks holding when clenched from within and the maids cried good gracious how very tenacious they as well might endeavour to pull off her skin she shrieked with the pain but all efforts were vain in vain did they strain every sinew and muscle the cushion stuck fast from that hour to her last 
she could never get rid of that comfortless bustle and e'en as macbeth when devising the death of his king heard the very stones prate of his whereabouts so this shocking bad wife heard a voice all her life crying murder resound from the cushion or thereabouts with regard to the clerk we are left in the dark as to what his fate was but i cannot imagine he got off scot-free though unnoticed it be both by riba danera and jacques de voragine for cut-throats were sure can be never secure and history's muse still to prove it her pen holds as you'll see if you look in a rather scarce book god's revenge against murder by one mr reynolds moral now you grave married pilgrims who wander away like ulysses of old vide homer and naso don't lengthen your stay to three years and a day and when you are coming home just write and say so and you learned clerks who are not given to rome stick close to your books nor lose sight of decorum don't visit a house when the master's from home shun drinking and study the viti sanctorum above all you gay ladies who fancy neglect in your spouses allow not your patience to fail but remember gengolfa's wife and reflect on the moral enforced by her terrible tale end of section eighteen